this is a rerun. Some of you might have seen the stand-up on uh, on Geek, but due to popular demand, we prepared a re-release as uh, Gold Edition. So there will be at least three new jokes, and we worked on the main character. I mean, we were pretty satisfied with the model, so the model stayed the same, but we worked on the te texturing. I think it, it's better. And, you know, uh, I prepared a presentation. Uh, the graphic for the last year, but for, for this year, we thought ah, we need something more personal, more higher quality. So, so I asked AI to generate a dumpster fire for me. The next slide, please. Okay. So yeah, I think this this is the state of our industry right now. <laughs> so, 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 I like making games mainly because it's very easy. It's making games is very easy. Uh, maybe you have a different experience, but ask a gamer on the internet, and they will explain to you how easy it is to make a game. But that was a joke. Don't talk to gamers on the internet. Self-care is important, right? But, uh, but I, you know, I, I mean, making games should be easy. And, um, even if you know anything about how games are made, I mean, how hard it is to set a dumpster on fire, <laughs> but but I like I like making games. I, I like game dev, the the industry, the creative energy. You know the small perks of the industry. I was talking to a friend working in a suit and tie corporation, and he asked me how it was to how it is to work in an industry with no dress code. And I said, no dress code? Like, don't you see the hoodie? <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm not a fan of dress code, but I really like hoodies, you know, soft, nice to touch. And at least in my experience, you get them for free. Yeah? <laughs> in any color you want, so long as it is black. <laughs> so last year, I had this life hack that get hired and fired from a few game companies, and you will never have to, you know, buy a hoodie again. But this year, please just get hired. <laughs> Self-care is important, yes? I, I like hoodies because I can put my headset on, put the you know, hood over my head, hunch over my desk, and, and hyper-focus. And no one, no one will disturb me because I won't be able to hear them and they won't be able to make eye contact with me. Worked for me for, uh, every time. And I think that, that it is curious that the garment of choice, the clothing of choice in our industry is something that's sensory very nice, nice to touch, touch that promotes hyper-focus and promotes antisocial behaviors, <laughs> like neurodivergent match. Who, who can sympathize? Okay, okay, the rest of you, don't worry, you will get your diagnosis yet. So, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, have you noticed how, how many of us in the industry have really cool like hobbies, special interests, painting figurines, airsoft guns, I don't know, baking specially pastries, uh, uh, carpentry, horticulture, I, I think that's, that's cool. And speaking of autism, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was talking with a friend uh, the other day, and she said that uh, she read books, uh, when she read books, she, she didn't care for, for the setting or for the story. She read books for, for emotions, relations, and situations, because that is how she learned about uh, normal human interactions. And I, and I could totally agree, you know, because I also learned everything I know about the expected social beha behavior from a book. And the book was called The Lord of the Rings. Okay, laugh what you want, but I'm telling you that The Lord of the Rings is the book you need to read to understand how it is to make a game. Be because bear with me, bear with me. You are just a humble, let's say, designer, living your insignificant, cozy little life in your insignificant, you know, little hole, doing your insignificant little tasks. Life is good. A and suddenly, your lead drops in, you know, Mental, me mentor figure, very experienced, very old. Well, uh, given the turnover in, this, in the industry, he's probably 36. So, you know, ancient, yeah? And he looks at one of your ideas and he gasps, oh, this is the one, this is the one idea to gather them all and in the gameplay bind them. And you, you are the chosen one. All you have to do is to develop the idea 
and drop it, submit it into the cracks of destiny in Mount Build before the producers notice. <laughs> because, <laughs> because if the producers notice and if the management learned of the idea, they would grab it, they would corrupt it, and you know, feature crib would spill all over the studio and the game as we know it would, would be over. So you, you're excited, oh, this is you know, an adventure. You, you sneak to the secret conference room for the last friendly kickoff before the wilds of development. You know, disclaimer, for this part, to fully enjoy it, you have to be a basic Lord of the Rings nerd. I don't think this is a problem in this demographics, but you know, <laughs> the rest of you just laugh along. So the last friendly kickoff, you are all hyped and excited, it's like, you have my art and my coat, yeah, and you, and you, and you form a strike team, a, a fellowship even, and you embark upon the adventure. Fast forward a few months to the dark, deep mines of crunch, where you use your lose your mentor. He, he faces the primordial demon of backlog. Thou shalt not pass! And he plunges into the abyss of burnout. Uh, test, you fools! <laughs> and the road is not easy. The road is not easy. There are acts of heroism and, and, and betrayal. There are very smart shortcuts, shortcuts that really make the way longer. And there are, you know, uh, uh, schemes and, and, and epic battles, uh, I, I mean, creative disagreements. And, as Tom Bombadil used to say, there is a lot of cut content. <laughs> then, then, your lead comes back from, from his sig leave and he's totally reinvented himself, you know. New look, <laughs> new ideas, so... <laughs> so, most of the team is swept away to deal with a dumpster fire, I mean a side quest in another department, and suddenly you are alone, just, just you, your best buddy from the QA, and this weird, resentful guy who's been working here like since forever, who's constantly mumbling to him, himself that he, that he had the same idea in 1994, but <laughs> nobody listened, oh, his precious idea. Is it scary? Well, yes, it is. Do you continue? Well, of course you do, because of the sunk cost fallacy. Hmm? You have sacrificed too much to give up now. So, so you crunch on. You find a secret, dark, dangerous path through the towering mountains of feature lock. You know, sneak night after night through the ashen plains of, of the beta, and, and suddenly you reach Mount Build, where in the cracks of destiny you have to submit your idea. But you can't. The idea is too precious to you. You just, you just need a little more time to polish it. One, two iterations. And as you hesitate, the producers notice what's going on. And the, and the leadless, fiery eye of the management turns on you, and you are exposed, and everything seems to be lost. And then, in a totally predictable turn of events, the, the weird, resentful guy steals your work and sub submits it as his own, and the build goes live, and nobody can do anything about it. The management is furious, but helpless. And the feature, it really ties the game together. So, you know, the guy gets fired, of course, but, but you, you can go back to your hole in the ground, a hero, like wiser, perhaps. I, I see that we all know the story. Like, <laughs> happens to most of us, at least once, <laughs> I guess. So. As I've told you, read The Lord of the Rings uh, to be prepared how to make a game. It, 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 it teaches you to listen to your elders, to sacrifice your life for the project, <laughs> to manage information and not to be overly transparent with the dark riders of the production. Uh, it teaches you that, that ownership and authorship of an idea is a social construct and <laughs> sometimes for the good of the project, someone just has to misappropriate your work. It teaches you that, Mr. Buggins, eagles are for the management. You can, you can go on foot. Come on, come on, little hobbit. We, we can do it. We can do it. So, so it, it teaches you to be 
an obedient drone in an environment as toxic as the ashen plains of Mordor. It got, got too dark too quickly, maybe. It was, it was a joke. I am probably you know, con 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 compensating for some things that might have happened to me in the past, you know, theoretically, <coughs> the Witcher. <coughs> so yeah, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that was a joke. This is a comedy routine because, because the real morale the real morale from the Lord of the Ring is the following. There are no women. <laughs> I, I mean, there is Galadriel in Human Resources. <laughs> and, and there's one diversity hire who wears a hoodie so she doesn't st uh, stand up. She, she keeps meeting deadlines that no man should be able to meet. But everyone dismisses her anyway because... And you know, women, yeah. <laughs> I, I am sorry, that is the state of the industry. Like, everyone pretends that women didn't exist. And, and, and look at the players. A new cool game comes out, and suddenly the internet is like, waiter, <laughs> excuse me, waiter, there is a woman in my entertainment. <laughs> And, and I, I get it, I, I know players, j gamers just want their uh, games to be realistic. And unpolitical, right? I get it. So <laughs> let's take realism, like visual fidelity. I, I'm amazed how, how, how much the industry progressed over the last years. When I started, the bar was set really low by today's standards. The main character just couldn't be you know, too angular, too square looking. He could have some edges. Uh, edge was OK. <laughs> but, but now, now you can render even the tiniest hair on a character's cheek. And yet, you render the tiniest hair on the cheek of a cheek, and suddenly there's an outrage. We want realism. OK, here's, here's Eloy. Ah, the hair is disgusting. Well, I agree, I agree, I agree. Nothing says realism like tribal, post-apocalyptic new stone age with laser hair removal. Mm? <laughs> but that's not the problem I hear. Um, we just don't want our games to be political. Okay, yeah, I, I, I get you. I, I too have mixed feelings about uh, games where you know white Americans shoot people of color for the good of Western civilization. No, those games are okay. Oh, okay, so so you must be talking about the games showing that for immigrants, uh, minorities, uh, sometimes the only way of uh, advancement in society is through criminal structures. Uh, leave GTA alone. <laughs> OK, OK, so you must be talking about games, let's say, romanticizing the genocide and land grab that laid foundation for today's America. Red Dead Redemption is not political, man. OK, OK, uh, I'm maybe a bit confused. What do you mean by political? What are political games? Well, political is when they put women and gay people into our games for no reason at all. That's political, and that's oppression, that's woke agenda, and, and I know what you will say, that I should take a break from social media. And you're right, self-care is important. But, but, but you can't escape from those opinions, because the other day we got email at work, and it was like, gentlemen, I'm writing to you as a gamer. And to give you full context, I do have a wife. My wife is a feminist. And I um, consider myself a feminist too. But can't you make a, a normal game with a male protagonist? Because I love and respect women, but they just don't work as main characters. Uh, it's not realistic, I guess. Best regards, blah, 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 blah. Well, unsolicited advice. Don't you just you know, love it? And speaking of realism, Story time. This is an anecdote about a real person, like from my private life. I had a friend. Uh, she's an ex-model, long blonde hair, beautiful woman. Woman. She 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 has PhD in I don't know genetics or um, molecular biology from the Univers University of Oxford. Uh, she was trained to be a coroner. Yeah, and uh, and she's a fencer, like historical 
um, European martial arts, you know, long sword, side sword, rapier. She wins international fencing contests. She runs her own fencing school. I mean, who wrote her? <laughs> you know, as a professional, yeah? As a professional, uh, uh, sword fighting, ex-model, dog, oh, and for those who love the, uh, or uh, like this kind of fandom, she's a blood princess, like recognized by some of the European aristocracy. So, uh, sword fighting, ex-model, princess doctor from Oxford, like a, a classic Mary Sue if I ever saw one, yeah? Yeah, sloppy work, sad, yeah? <laughs> I also uh, consider myself, you know, uh, a fencer, a, a bit. I, I've trained long sword for a few years. And if I ever had the occasion to cross my blade with her, well, she would totally humiliate me, but at least, at least I would have the occasion <laughs> to shout, woman, you are unrealistic. <laughs> uh, just stop. <laughs> Why I am saying this? Because I think that there is so many of us humans, and we are so very different that many of us can be a kick-ass inspiration for a video game character. Not everything interesting has to happen to straight uh, white ma males. Yeah? I'm a straight white guy myself, and well, not many interesting things happen to me. And that's exactly the problem I hear. Our, our straight white male life sucks. And we, we need those sexy, fit, muscular heroes, no homo, you know, to escape the drudgery of our daily existence. And I get it. But what about the rest? Like women, LGBT community, like rainbows and unicorns? No, everyone needs and deserves their power fantasies. Like, like self-care is important, right? <laughs> and, you know, personally, I like when a character in a video game is someone very different from me, because I'm exposed, exposed to different worldviews, I can learn to empathize. This is probably how I learn about the world in general. But that might be just autism, <laughs> because when you press a hypothetical vocal gamer on the internet, you know, it's a bit like pressing a rip, ripe pimple. Yeah? When you press him, you soon learn what the problem really is. Eloy is fat and ugly, and I would never fuck her. Well, thank you for sharing with the class, <laughs> and congratulations on your self-esteem. Because when I think about an intimate moment with Eloy, let's assume for the sake of this discussion that she were into men at all. Yeah? When I think about it, I think that, uh, would, would Eloy fuck me? <laughs> I, I mean, this... Uh, this, well, maybe meets some very specific definitions of sexy, but, but Eloy, well, I might not be in her league, <laughs> yeah? And, uh, and again, you might say, why do you obsess about uh, what some randos on the internet say, like hashtag not all gamers, just ignore the vocal minority. Yeah, that's a good that's a good advice. Self care is important, but, 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 the other day we were talking with a group of friends slash colleagues, many years in the industry, very experienced, like good craftsmanship, and suddenly one of the guys says, "This is this is bad design. She's not fuckable enough." Fuckable. <laughs> a disclaimer. You may ask, <laughs> am I in the position to talk about representations, representation of women in games? Like, like, don't I have too many penises like, to have the moral right to, to take this stand? Well, I, I might have. I might have. But, but, but it just pisses me off, personally, like, like using fuckability as an argument in, in discussion about game design. I just think, personally, that this is a shitty way about talking about design. And, and let me explain. It, it's not about being a prude or not wanting to have sex in, in, in games. Sex is generally okay, and fantasizing about fictional characters is okay too. You know, who hasn't at some moment of our lives fantasized about you know, a bunch of textured, textured polygons? 
Well, I have. <laughs> no judgment here. No judgment here. Well, uh, my, my wife was a bit judgmental when I was playing The Witcher 3 about, as she put it, me fucking Yennefer. Because, as she put it, that woman was toxic. <laughs> <laughs> but no judgment from my side. Uh, uh, as far as I am concerned, we can all go home and rub one out to the fictional character of our choice. Like, self-care is important, right? <laughs> and the other way around, it's, it's, it's totally okay to say that I would never have sex with this fictional characters or, or, or that fictional character. Because, you know, sexual fantasies, intimacies, is something very personal. Not, not everyone has a thing for um, Pikachu. Some do. No judgment here. <laughs> Curiosity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> what I was trying to say is that it's, it's perfectly OK <laughs> to be turned on or off by a fictional character. So that's OK. What I have problem with is when a guy, usually a lead or someone from the upper management, comes in and says, this is not fuckable enough. Increase. Fuckability. <laughs> Been there, done that, got all the Witcher sex cards. <laughs> a, a pinnacle of game design, you know. Also, a very important moment in my, in my life, because that was the moment when, in a professional setting, during a design meeting, I learned about the term MILF. Uh, so, so <laughs> uh, the Witcher sex cards. I, I'm waiting forward so much to seeing them in 4K or 3D in the upcoming The Witcher remake. Yeah? <laughs> so, so we hate strong, sexy women, someone could say. Well, someone did say that because, as you can see, this is my favorite topic to argue with people on, on the internet. So, how can I respond? Well, I have nothing against, against you know, sexy characters. If the sexiness is in line with uh, with the character, the background, the mood of the game, mm, that, 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 that's great, that's great. But, but saying this female character is not fuckable enough, this is such a bad design, I have problem with that. Because if I say that, I think I'm not a good designer. I think I'm being a dick. Because, you know, I'm thinking with a dick. <laughs> and I put my pref personal preferences and, and uh, sexual fantasies over the consistency of, uh, of my design. And, uh, you know, and uh, let's take, it's always like this. Like, it's always, always like this, you know. <laughs> Horses' balls, uh, shrinking in the cold, mm, realism, good craft. Women with different body types, oh, outrage. <laughs> yeah, and, and take, take a look at, at Siri from The Witcher 3. You know, she was a witcher, trained, to be a warrior since she was a little girl. You know, she could fight blind, uh, uh, blindfolded based on hearing alone. You can imagine how people with such training move. Well, according to the Witcher 3, they run like this. On high heels, tiny little steps, helpless, like a, like a model on a runway. I wanted to, to shout, Siri, drop the act. You're in the model on, on the forest, nobody's looking. And she would answer, sorry, mate, sorry, mate. Uh, the creative director is always looking, besides, that is my approved fuckability level. <laughs> Won't you think about the target group, I hear. What about those poor boys whose sexual fantasies and frustrations we would like to exploit for the greater good, which is the satisfaction of our shareholders? <laughs> oh, no, well, well, those... Poor boys have porn hub. Don't worry about them. They will manage. But the point is valid. The point is valid. The target group. Half of the gamers, of the players, are male. Well, <laughs> that means the other half are female. But I don't see similar care put into designing suitably fuckable male characters. Like, could you Im imagine a creative director comes in, looks and girl's new model, girl's new model runs him around a bit and says, this is not fuckable enough. Increase fuckability. <laughs> and some programmer spends, I don't know, two months 
twitching and polishing the physics of Gerald's butt. And in the making of the audio department explains how they used raw chicken breast and a wooden ruler to simulate the sound of Gerald's ass cheeks clapping together as he rides a horse. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think I have a solution for the whole debacle. Let's just add fuckability to accessibility options. And, <laughs> and I would start a game. <laughs> I would start a game and be like, uh, mouse inverted, uh, audio FX low, fuckability, uh, brand of, uh, of Tarth. Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> because, because I like my female characters, like my uh, game production messed up and on fire. <laughs> besides, 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 the mic drop, when it, when it comes to, you know, the objectification of the male form, belongs uh, to someone else. Bear with me. Bear. With me, I'm talking about Baldur's Gate 3, and their very particular answer to the question, would you rather, rather be alone in the woods with a man <laughs> or a bear? <laughs> and have you noticed that nobody com complained that it was gay sex? Be all the fragile men must have been too distracted by, by the bear with heavily implied erection. Like, you know, paint me like one of your French bears. Because, because being gay is clearly political, but shagging a bear happens to the best of us. <laughs> uh, switching the topic, switching the topic. Gamers just don't get how messy a game production is. Like, they always complain on the internet, like, oh, this game is shitty, oh, they clearly cut some finished content to keep it for updates, but, de but developers, like, like, we had any choice in that? <clears throat> now, game production can be very messy. One time, one time, I was living in a place that had a, a trash gazebo, like these separate buildings for, for, for dumpsters, and this particular uh, gazebo didn't have door. So people from all around the neighborhood were, were just dropping their trash there, and at night, stray dogs and crows would have a fist, and, you know, a disaster. And one day, when I was taking out the trash, I stumbled uh, upon a, a, a homeless guy, just, you know, rummaging through the stuff. And he looked at me, clearly uh, upset and exasperated, and said, what is wrong with you? This, this place is a fucking mess. <laughs> and I thought, you're right, you're right. But you clearly haven't seen the Witcher quest structure a day before the release. <laughs> yeah. Gamers always say that we make shitty games and, and we cut stuff out for the updates. But, but game production is a, is a mighty beast. It's a force of nature. Once it gains momentum, it becomes unstoppable and unmanageable. Like, trying to fight with it is like pissing against a tornado. Yeah? And, uh, and I, nobody wants to make a shitty game. Like, it just, it just happens. There is no enshittification department that comes in after the beta to find the most cost-effective way to fuck up the, the experience. Like, this doesn't happen. And I told this to a friend who worked on a game with, let's say, less than stellar, stellar reviews. I said, you know, I don't know. I, I know we don't do it on purpose. It just happens. And he said, nah, we knew the game was shit. <laughs> But, you know, the boss was too much of a dick, and, and we, we just didn't have heart anymore to care about what we do. Self-care is important. So, well, but that's probably the only case, because it never happens, right? You are laughing, but that was, supposed, that was not supposed to be a job, a, a joke, because, you know, the management, they earn a lot of money for a reason. They, they clearly must know how to motivate a team and plan a successful production. Nobody takes money for nothing, yeah? And, and we have all those new, exciting, like, technologies, you know, design thinking, agile. Yeah, that's, that's a help. I like good comedy. When, when, so when I first heard about Scrum, I was overjoyed. 
But let me tell you, let me tell you, the first daily stand-up meeting, huge disappointment. I was the only one who prepared anything funny. <laughs> although, although looking back, looking back, the schedule was a joke. So, <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah. and and removing stuff from a from a nearly finished game for, for the updates. Why would I do that? Like. Why would I remove something that, that finally worked? Like, it would be like, like I'm doing a miracle. You know, uh, Jesus is bringing Lazarus back to life, and I'm like, <laughs> could you do it again? Yeah. <laughs> Plus, have you ever tried to remove anything from a newly finished game? Have you tried it? It's like, it's like dumpster diving. Like, it, I'll explain it to you. Imagine, you are spending an afternoon over your special interest, you take off your wedding ring because uh, so so it wouldn't get lost. Then you take out the trash, and the ring is nowhere to be, to, to be found. And you know what happened. So you <laughs> run outside, you dive into the dumpster, and you start looking for your trash bag. And 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 the thought strikes: Oh, I'm I'm not the chosen one. <laughs> I'm looking for a ring in a very dark place. I, I'm Gollum. Uh, by the way, a game about Gollum, that could be a swell idea. Why, why, why nobody thought about it? That could be a killer <laughs> for the studio, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> never mind, never mind. You surface for the air and you find yourself eye to eye with a neighbor. You don't even explain. You just grab your bag and run upstairs. You, you grab two bags because uh, you're not sure which one is yours. You put them in, in the bathtub, open the first one. You get a, a, a glimpse into a private life of your neighbors. Oh, mm -hmm. You open the second bag. Uh, luckily, there's uh, a Chinese from yesterday, so you take the chopsticks, you so sift through the through the trash. Everything is seeping this this trash juice. You know, it looks like like strong Earl Grey tea, but smells differently. But the ring is not there. So you take out the trash. Go up, take a shower. You won't be soaking in the bathtub for a month, probably. Self-care is important. And when you put on the trousers, you find the ring in this special pocket. You put it there so it wouldn't get lost. So, removing things from nearly finished game is exactly like that. But the dumpster is on fire. <laughs> and you are in hell. <laughs> Because we all know how hot it is just before the release, how intense it is. You know, you crunch a bit, but for a good cause. Yeah, I, I'm talking about, about the moment where everything is so, so intense and exciting and hard about the, the, last, the last few years of the production. <laughs> <laughs> I know, hashtag not all studios. In, in my personal experience, I would say 50-50. Like, <laughs> half of the studios crunch, like the, the bigger half. I, I mean, with bigger games, bigger projects, because making games is, is easy, right? And, and before you start explaining things to me, I realized that making game is a complex system with a lots of moving parts, AKA a dumpster on fire. <laughs> and, and we, the creators, we are creatures of passions creatures of passion, we, we have nothing against staying, you know, sacrificing a, a weekend or two just to see our work completed on time. But I'm not talking about an occasional weekend, I'm talking about planning for crunch. Because it seems to me, personally, that some companies do exactly that. Because if you crunch, crunch on your first game, well, that's bad luck. But lack of experience, let's say. Second game, Still bad luck. But when you do your third game and you are still crunching, well, that takes some planning, I think. And anecdote, totally, totally unrelated, totally unrelated. When we were working on The Witcher, um, <laughs> at some point, we were in the same open space, designers and the uh, guys from, from the QA. OK, one woman, but. <laughs> and one day, one of the QA uh, people was sitting on, on, his, on his chair and he was playing with, with a toy sword. And it looked like he was calculating something in his head, like complex mathematical equation. And I asked, 
man, w w what's going on? And he said, oh, oh no, I'm just, I'm just trying to calculate the way to kill all designers in one, one go. <laughs> and we were like, okay, like at this moment, the guy has been sleeping six days uh, a week, six nights a week under his desk for a month. Like he deserved some, you know, some entertainment. <laughs> Self-care is important. And at least, at least we knew that he was living in the office <laughs> because <laughs> there was another guy. He was planning to move from one flat to another. There was a mix up and he <laughs> had to stay somewhere. So he lived in the, in the studio for two weeks and nobody noticed because there was always someone <laughs> sitting late in front of the computer. There was always someone sleeping in a conference room. There was always someone going out of the, of the showers. A guy lived in a studio for two weeks and nobody noticed because sometimes making games is like having the one ring. It makes you invisible <laughs> to your friends and family you just you just disappear <laughs> yeah and i see a trend but, but um, you know when i crunched on the witcher it was ha oh, oh, ha oh, years ago it was for 3 months and um, from what i know that was the shortest pre-release crunch in this company <laughs> uh, but at least they are paying for overtime now Th that's a real improvement companies started paying for overtime. And, you know, that's a very happy coincidence. They put aside money in the budget to pay for overtime. Uh, for, uh, overtime. I, I, I say it is a coincidence because they are not planning for crunch, right? <laughs> and I see a trend when it comes to some companies, some big companies. Uh, they crunch because there is a game to be finished and released and somebody learns about it, a journalist writes an article about it, and there's an outrage and the company uh, apologizes and says that they will, will never crunch again. And they keep that promise until they have a game to be finished and released and then they crunch. And the journalist learns about it and writes an article about how they've broken their promise. And everybody is sad is, and disillusioned. And the company apologizes to the players <laughs> and promises never to crunch again. Uh, and they probably <laughs> keep that promise uh, until there is a game to be <laughs> finished and released. And you may say that I am a bit jaded but this is just how uh, called dependency, called dependency and abusive relationships work. Daddy promises never to drink again. <laughs> and for some time, he doesn't. But then he does. <laughs> and everyone is sad and heartbroken. But what were they expecting if daddy didn't go to therapy? and made no other lifestyle changes. And to go to therapy, you need to acknowledge you have a problem. And if I asked a CEO of a big game company, he would say, dude, I don't have a problem. I have a Ferrari <laughs> and a summer house on Costa del Sol. I bought them last month because self-care is important. <laughs> besides, besides, it was a voluntary crunch, like people could choose if they wanted to work on Sunday or on Saturday. <laughs> Besides, says the management, it was the team's decision to crunch. We just communicated the release date that couldn't be postponed and the scope of the game that couldn't be cut in any way. And based on that information, the team decided to crunch. Personally, says the management, we are strictly anti-crunch. Self-care is important. So I wouldn't be holding my breath, yeah? <laughs> and you know, uh, the management sometimes reminds me of, of, of those old elves from Lord of the Rings, all good intentions and calculated friendliness. You are the one going to Mordor, but at least Galadriel will bring you swag from the conference you didn't have time to attend, and Elrond will pay for the midnight pizza. <laughs> And I also hope that maybe they, uh, th those people and the management style is a part of an era soon to be gone. 
A Boy Can Dream, because let's be serious, The Lord of the Rings is an old book, it's an old story. Nowadays, there are no bad guys who come to you bearing gifts only to corrupt you and bind you to their will. You know, guys from distant lands where there is, let's say, dark for most of the time, guys who want to, you know, gather it all and in the darkness bind it, like, like embrace it all. <laughs> you know who, who, who I'm talking about, yeah? I'm talking about guys who at the end of the third era, when Sauron's engines of merger and acquisition crashed and burned, those guys would be still worrying about the satisfaction of Mordor's shareholders. <sighs> yeah, it's a turbulent market. But I like making games. Because making games is easy. What is hard is finishing games. <laughs> At least for me. You know, there is always the one more idea to try, the one more bug to fix, the one more things to polish. And it's like, like the scene in a horror movie, you know, with the endless corridor. The faster I run, the faster the exit moves away. It feels the same way. The more I work on a nearly finished game, the more there is to finish. And after all these years in the industry, you know, I start wondering that maybe I am part of the problem. I mean, you know, maybe the end of the production is not the best moment to test new ideas. <laughs> maybe, maybe there is a, a, di a difference between pushing for quality and feature creep. Maybe, maybe sometimes it is better to decide that this idea can wait for an update. But it never feels that way. Because what it feels like is that I have found the one idea. And it is precious to me. And I just have to sneak so the producers <laughs> didn't notice and push the idea into cracks of destiny in mount build. So I keep staying overnight. And sometimes somebody finds me and asks, what are you doing? Well, I have this idea, and it is precious to me. <laughs> yes, but what are you doing? Well, I told you, I'm working on a brilliant idea of mine. Yes, 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 but what are you doing? <laughs> I'm saving the project. I am the hero. Yes, yes, but what it is, Exactly what you are doing at this very moment. Ah, okay, okay. I, you know, I'm just pouring gasoline into the dumpster. <laughs> Thank you very much.